Uh, well, let's make a start. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's a very, very great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Alan McLean. Now, um, I hope you won't be offended, Alan, if I give you a little, give the people a little bio, just a very small one. So, Alan um, is a medical graduate from Dunedin, from Otago, uh, and then uh, he spent the greater part of his working life, I would imagine, in London uh, and in UK uh, doing ONG. And so uh, he now is uh, Emeritus Professor of Gynecology from University College, I think, in London. Uh, but uh, happily now, uh, for us, he's retired in Wanaka. Uh, and so he has um, uh, agreed to give us a, a, a talk on one of the many topics in which he is very expert. Among other things, um, he is... Uh, uh, a member of the Society of Apothecaries of London, uh, which I am also a member. So uh, we're, it's kind of like a, um, a you know, uh, a Rosicrucian society. You know, we've got this, um, uh, you know, sort of secret handshake thing. Pill, pill rolling. Yes, yeah, the white pill rolling. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and a slight twitch and a shudder. Um, so anyway, uh, the Society of Apothecaries is an institution that is uh, interested in teaching, uh, particularly history of medicine, and so we're both very enthusiastic about that. Anyway, enough of that. Alan, it's, it's a very great pleasure to have you here, and so uh, we're really looking forward to your, your talk. Thank you Thank very, you very much, much, Terence. Now, just two more minutes, so this has nothing to do with obstetrics and gynaecology. As Terence said, we were both involved with the apothecaries and they run a diploma course on the history of medicine and there is so much such a wealth of history medical history in London as I got to the twilight of my career I realized that I should probably delve into some of this and so studied for the diploma in the history of medicine and to to do this you have to do a dissertation and I chose this topic and we also do a test lecture, and maybe that will appear on another occasion, if you're it going to have me back. Uh, but this was the dissertation. And so prior to being in London, I had lived in, in Scotland and knew a little bit about Edinburgh. But during this project, I explored some of the depth of medicine in Edinburgh, and then came out and spent many long hours in the Hocken going through the minutes of the University Council and looking, and I'm going to show you some of that. I'm not really going to tell you a lot about John Halliday Scott because there are many who have written about this man and can give you a better description than I can. But I'm going to ask the question why? Why would a 25-year-old medical graduate in probably one of the best departments in the world, the Department of Anatomy in Edinburgh, why would you consider going to the other side of the world, to a new country, a new town, and an even younger university? And so what I want to do with you is just to look at some of the people and some of the factors that were involved. And I'm going to start off with a little bit of uh, okay, maybe if we go that way. A little bit of history and I apologize because many of you will know and probably know this better than I do. But in the seventy years after Cook arrived on these islands, the only visitors and occasionally settlers were whalers and sealers and missionaries and the odd trader who came across from Australia until the New Zealand company established formal immigration and the person that we know associated with that Edward Gibbon Wakefield and his two brothers uh, Colonel Tom uh, Colonel William and uh, and Captain Arthur who were involved in it. Wakefield was a member of Parliament. He led an interesting life at the age of 30. Two years after his first wife had died, 
He abducted a 15-year-old with the purposes of marrying her. She was extremely rich, and he thought this was going to be the solution for the rest of his life. Instead, he spent three years sitting in prison, and I think during that time started to wonder where he was going to and where the world was going to. And so when he came out, he decided that politically he would have to do something about the English cities, deprivation, overcrowding, and that probably the only solution was to get the people out and send them off somewhere else. And his initial idea was to go to South Australia, but for various reasons concentrated on New Zealand. And so he set up the New Zealand Association and then the company, he became a director he spent a lot of time, and I guess politicians do this, arguing about funding. So he spent time with um, Stanley, who was the colonial secretary, who in fact wasn't very supportive of colonisation. Uh, Lord Melbourne, who became the Prime Minister, and having a city named after him in this part of the world, seemed to support the idea. Trying to get funding was another issue. And one of the concepts was that if you were going to colonise New Zealand, then it had to be based around Auckland. That was the only part that seemed to be worth settling, where people were already and don't go further afield. And so the idea is that you might try and establish settlements, and the first one was Port Nicholson, where they arrived in 1839. Port Nicholson became Britannia, and then someone said, let's name it after the Duke of Wellington, and so that became Wellington Port Hardy, as it was known initially, but then was named after the other great British hero, Nelson. There were settlers from Plymouth who made their way out here, and they went to New Plymouth. And Wakefield was also involved in some of the planning for the Canterbury settlers. The Scottish equivalent was George Rennie. George Rennie was born in Scotland. He studied at university, became an artist and a sculptor. He became the Liberal Member of Parliament for Ipswich. One of his contributions is that, in, particularly in London, but most of England, you get free entry to the galleries and the museums. That's what Rennie did. And Rennie was aghast that of the 76 vessels that the New Zealand Company sent out here, only three of them came from Scottish ports where there was lots of poverty, deprivation, unemployment. For example, in Paisley, not far out of Glasgow, of the 44,000 people living in Paisley, a quarter of them were out of work and starving. And those who did have work had to work at least 16 hours a day just to be able to make ends meet. And so Rennie took up the cause for the Scottish cities. And along with the New Zealand Company in the Colonial Gazette, published an advert that they were going to establish what was at that time the fourth settlement, and this was going to be New Edinburgh. And so Rennie organised a group of the great and good in Edinburgh and in Glasgow. Among them you'll see members of, or first of all, James Forrest, who was equivalent to the Mayor, the Lord Provost, a uh, series of members of Parliament. I'm going to come back and mention Robert Cargill. And that this group had a, uh, an area in St Andrew's Square where they established their, their office and they were served by two secretaries, Dr Alcorn, who in fact came from Oban, and a young lawyer to the Supreme Court of Edinburgh and his name was John McGlashan. Now, for several years, they looked at the feasibility of establishing a strictly Scottish settlement. And Rennie was pivotal to the initial discussion. 
But there was another two people who joined him, the first being William Cargill. William Cargill was a veteran of the British Army. He'd seen action in India and in the Peninsular Wars in, uh, in what was Spain at that time. After he was demobilised, he took up banking, but he was convinced that immigration was something to be pursued, and he was initially interested in Canada, but then met up with these people and decided he was going to target his resources into helping to establish the Scottish uh, or the Otago Association for the New Zealand Company. And the other person, the Reverend Thomas Burns. Now Thomas Burns' father was Gilbert Burns, his uncle was the poet Robert Burns. Thomas Burns was born three months after his uncle died so that there was no connection between them. Thomas Burns' early experiences had been in farming through his father and then later on he joined the church. And along with about 400 ministers at that time, 1843, they left the established Church of Scotland to become the Free Church. And this was an argument about patronage. The people wanted to appoint their own ministers to preach from the pulpit of the Kirk. And the idea that people were going to make decisions and select uh, others that the congregation didn't always agree with led to this uh, efflux from the established church. And so these two became pivotal in this group to look at taking a, a Scottish uh, settlement to, out to New Zealand. Sorry. One of the first things that happened was that they abandoned the name New Edinburgh. New Edinburgh had been a settlement, uh, the Darien project in the Isthmus of America, where a lot of Scottish money had been invested and Scottish settlers came to try and do something in that area where the Panama Canal now is. Uh, most of them died of yellow fever and the few that got out were bankrupt and that was a bit of a disaster so they quickly wiped New Edinburgh from their planning and hit upon the name Dunedin. Dunedin had been used by Walter Scott in his poem The Lay of the Last Minstrel and it comes from the Gaelic which means fort on the rock which is entirely appropriate in Edinburgh uh, but for those early settlers who arrived here and made their way through the marsh and tried to establish a town on the edge of the harbour, a fort on the rock must have seen, seemed a long way away. It was proposed that they look at the Middle Island, and in those days the South Island was the Middle Island between the North and Stewart Island. And they chose the Middle Island because there had been skirmishing in the North Island and even the northern part of the what we now call the South Island uh, had been attacked by Tarapraha and some of his uh, chieftains and so they proposed to come down and Port Cooper which is now Littleton and they explored the coastline so through Moraki uh, Waikoaiti uh, through to what became Port Chalmers, down to Tyree Mouth, down to Port Molyneux. All that was explored looking for a potential site for the Fort on the Rock, for Dunedin. And the idea was that once they found this, they were going to put in a wharf, they were going to put in accommodation, there would be a school because the people that they were hoping to bring out here were going to bring their families and of course the church was going to be here. The ideal to plant in the congenial soil of New Zealand a branch of their beloved Free Church of Scotland. And so 1848 the arrival of the settlers uh, 
And then as Dunedin got bigger and spread out the establishment of a provincial government, there were six provinces at that time, and with the uh, role of Cargill and Burns, the name MacAndrew appears, and he will come up later on as a driving force for the development of the medical school. And McGlashan, who had done a lot of hard work over the previous 10 or more years in getting the scheme up and going and getting immigrants here, decided this was too good to miss out. And so McGlashan arrived in Dunedin, unfortunately only uh, lived here for 10 years before he fell off a horse, had an intracerebral bleed, and died as a result of that. And so they appointed two lawyers as home agents, James Crawford and John Ald, and I'm going to come back and talk about them. I'm not really going to talk about the founding of the university, except that by then Dunedin was growing, and it had gold, so that there was a wealth and an enthusiasm to do something, and so established the university and the celebration of 150 years uh, last year. Now, MacAndrew had McAndrew had decided that a university's function was to provide training. It wasn't for <coughs> esoteric uh, study, but it had to have, there had to be a school of mining and there had to be a school of medicine. There wasn't a lot of enthusiasm from the local doctors in Dunedin at that time. They inquired of Melbourne, which was the only medical school in the Antipodes, and Melbourne was rather half-hearted in suggesting that they also set up a medical school. There was fierce opposition from Auckland and Canterbury because they wanted that opportunity. But McAndrew decided that they really had to go ahead. If they didn't, then they would miss out. And so, in a letter from McAndrew to the council, and the Vice-Chancellor at that time, Dr. Stewart, agreed they had to proceed, and so they wrote to their home agent, as in the choice of the first four professors, the University Council worked through its agents in Edinburgh, George, Andrew, and uh, at this stage, still John Old. Uh, no doubt they were expected to follow their former instructions because they'd previously appointed the first four professors here, and I'll mention those in a moment, to follow their instructions, to take expert advice, recommend a man of impeccable personal character, energy, scholastic achievements, and an aptness to teach. Youth was also an important factor. He was, and it was always going to be he, he was to receive 600 pounds a year but could take class fees, and those were a couple of guineas a term, I think, uh, but would not be permitted to conduct private practice, and I'm going to come back and talk about that. A medical degree, of course, was necessary, and the age should not exceed 30, so they were looking for someone who was young. Now, at that time, one of the recently appointed people, Captain Hutton, and he had been the geologist employed in Otago and he came onto the staff as a lecturer in geology. He wanted someone to teach zoology and there was a medical graduate from Edinburgh by the name of Millen Coutry. And Millen Coutry got wind that this position was coming up and so he put in his letter saying that he would be interested in the chair of anatomy and physiology. And also an extraordinary letter from a man, Daniel J. Cunningham. <clears throat> and I read this. Written from the manse, his father was Church of Scotland in Creef in Perthshire. Gentlemen, I beg most respectfully to offer myself for the chair of anatomy and physiology about to be instituted in the University of Otago. I've just finished my medical curriculum it is right, I should state, I have not yet graduated, but I hope to do so on the 1st of August 
which would have been that year. I am now 24 years of age. I am, gentlemen, your most obedient servant, T.J. Cunningham. Obviously very precocious. And if we look at Cunningham, Cunningham, I think, was rather dismissed because he wasn't yet qualified. Uh, Cunningham graduated from Edinburgh in medicine in, seven, in 1874. He got the gold medal for his MD two years later. He became a demonstrator in the Department of Anatomy and worked there for eight years. He was then appointed to the Chair of Anatomy, the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin. He then went on to Trinity College and then in the early 1900s came back to Edinburgh as Professor of Anatomy. He was a great writer of dissection manuals. So this is one that I had lying around and took a photo. He wrote dissection manuals and guides and I sometimes wonder how would it be if he had come to Dunedin. He certainly achieved a great deal back in um, both Ireland and Scotland, would he indeed have stayed here? But they dismissed Cunningham. And so Kutri became the preferred candidate, partly because he was already in New Zealand, he had his foot on dry land and a other foot in the door. He had graduated from Edinburgh, he'd spent some time demonstrating anatomy, He'd also done some teaching in Liverpool. And so the, the post was offered to him. Unfortunately, only on half the regular salary. So they previously talked about 600. Here they offered him 300 pounds. And I'm not sure, we don't know if he was insulted <laughs> by this, but as you'll see, it led to his undoing. And before he took up the post, he was instructed to go back to Britain and to obtain recognition for his teaching in the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, in Apothecaries Hall, the General Council for Medical Education and Registration UK, which is now the General Medical Council, and various universities, Glasgow, London, Durham, Aberdeen, Trinity College, Dublin, and Cambridge. And so he went round and with the help of the home agents, there's a lot of correspondence going back and forth. Kutri arrived back here and had some challenging times, partly because he had difficulty getting on with some of his medical colleagues and thought that the standard of their medical care wasn't always what it should be. He was also worried about the entry standard of some of his students. In those days, you didn't have university entrance, you didn't have medical intermediate. In fact, medical intermediate was originally set up to ensure that people who wanted to study medicine had to achieve a certain basic understanding in physics, chemistry, and zoology. And he had very low numbers. He had four students in his first year, two in the second year, and one of those two students left and went off to study law. He couldn't demonstrate anatomy because there was no anatomy act that enabled you to dissect the human body. So much of his teaching was dependent on diagrams and discussion. The only university that would accept his teaching was that in Glasgow. All the others rejected it and said partly the standard of the students and partly the other people involved with setting up the medical school, it was too immature and they wouldn't accept it. And then there was a letter to the University Council complaining that Kutri was engaging in private practice. He said he wasn't making money out of this, he was consulting, other doctors would ask him to see patients. He was enthusiastic about seeing patients. He would often see patients gratuitously and not charge them, but he felt that part of the practice of medicine had to be, uh, had to be kept up. So that was uh, 1876, 
he struggled, and I think one of his problems was he was a forthright man. He often he often said what he was thinking, and uh, people didn't always accept that. <coughs> and then the president of the Otago branch of the New Zealand Medical Association. Now, Kutri had been in instrumental in setting up the Otago branch, so it was sort of his group of doctors. The president then wrote to the University Council again and said, do you know that your professor of anatomy is still consulting? And so Kutri said to them, you'll need to explain to me exactly what your definition of consulting is and I'll tell you what I'm doing. But there was continuing bickering and so at the <coughs> end of that year Kutri offered his letter of resignation, half hoping that we're, they would say uh, will you stay on and post because we don't want uh, Canterbury getting the nudge on us. But they accepted his, his letter of resignation. And so onto the scene came <coughs> John Halliday Scott, born in Edinburgh, graduated or matriculated in Edinburgh to study medicine. Um, and we'll talk about some of his medals, but was recognized for his ability in anatomy, getting a certificate of merit, uh, and later on honors and a medal in anatomy Graduated in 1874, the same year as Cunningham. Did his house jobs in Edinburgh and in Stirling, and then was appointed to the position as demonstrator. And I suppose in the days that I remember doing anatomy, we had people who were doing their surgical fellowship who would come round and point out what we were about to cut our way through, usually by mistake. Uh, so he became a, a demonstrator and became also a member of the College of Surgeons. And along with 24 others applied for the job in Dunedin. Now the council was determined that they really had to quickly fill this gap. And so after Kutri had resigned, a telegraph was sent, a telegram was sent to the home agents. Uh, by this stage, it uh, was George Andrew and Hugh Old, the, the son of John. And an appointment committee was set up with Professor McKendrick, who was a physiologist from Glasgow, and William Turner, an anatomist, from Edinburgh and I'm going to come back and talk about the latter. A letter was sent to Dr Cunningham as he was then uh, by these agents saying uh, we've made up our minds to engage a professor on the understanding he will be allowed to take consulting practices and the advertisement will be altered to that effect and the University Council being very Presbyterian came back and said no way private practice. He will be taught to be an academic and and that was the end of it. And very quickly a selection was made, John Halliday Scott, in a letter of appointment. Dear Sir, we have the pleasure of intimating that you've been selected as the successful candidate and that has various other things and shall not accept any private practice of any description, whatever, where the strictly consulting practice or not. And so Scott was was appointed. Uh, this is him taken eight years after that appointment. It was taken around the time of his his wedding. Dignified academic chap. And this is where John Halliday Scott was baptized. Now this is the parish church, St Mary's in Broughton, which is part of the new town in Edinburgh. It is not free church. It's the Church of Scotland, and the man who christened him, baptised him, two years later became the moderator of the Church of Scotland, of the General Assembly, 
no evidence that Scott had anything to do with the forceful influences of the free church. Um, when he married, he married Helen Beely. Helen Beely from Beely Avenue in Christchurch, a well-known Christchurch family, and they were married in the Church of England Church in Cheltenham, back in England, and then his children were all christened in the Anglican Church here in North Dunedin. When I say here, I'm not sure if that church is still standing. Yeah. It is? Yeah. Oh, that's reassuring. So he wasn't a member of the Free Church of Scotland. These were the four professors who had been appointed before him. And going through the council minutes, I can't find any evidence of persuasion or any sort of correspondence between them and Scott. These people had all been selected by the home agents uh, you'll see that they had, or well, certainly three of them had Scottish connections. Duncan McGregor had started off in Aberdeen and then had studied medicine, but he was 10 years older than Scott and no evidence of any collusion. Uh, later on, he uh, gave some support to Scott in setting up the medical school and he he'd been appointed here Professor of Mental and Moral Philosophy, which essentially was involved in the theological hall, setting up uh, the teaching of theology. But he left, and he took over responsibility for care and running the asylum. Uh, and James Gow Black, who was teaching chemistry and supportive of what Scott was doing, but again, no evidence of any link. And then Mill and Kutri, and although they had both come through Edinburgh around the same time, uh, nothing to suggest that um, they had known each other prior to Scott arriving here, although in fact they turned out to be good colleagues later on. And when Scott became Dean of the Medical School, Kutri, in fact, became head of the staff committee of the hospital uh, and they worked together. Uh, and Kutri, in particular, was one of those who wrote to Auckland and said, there is no point in you trying to set up a medical school at this stage because we've got it covered and there's no way you could even uh, uh, attempt to do as good as what we are in, in Dunedin. Um, this is Andrew Scott, so John Halliday Scott's father, and Andrew Scott came from a long family of Scottish border farmers, uh, but he broke the mould and he came to Edinburgh to be a lawyer. He married twice, he had three sons to his first wife, and I'm going to mention the second son, also named Andrew. And then to his second wife, three boys, including John Halliday Scott, and also a daughter. And they lived in Drummond Place. And I'll show you where Drummond Place is. Uh, they both lived there. Uh, John Halliday Scott was born there. Uh, but Scott practiced law from there as well. And... Andrew Scott, to enable him to qualify law, became registered as a writer to the signet. That is, he was able to write the king, or at this stage, it would have been Queen Victoria, a writer of the queen's signature. So that if you wanted a legal document processed, even in Scotland, far away that it was, the the monarch signature was necessary and so these lawyers in a small group were able to uh, have this privilege. The society goes back a long time into the uh, 1369 and the, the reign of James V who was killed in the, bot in the Battle of Flodden Field, 1513. Um, 
and certainly in Scotland at that time, if you wanted to practice law, this was a society to join. Most of them were practicing in the new town along George Street and a relatively small membership. John Auld, and I've mentioned him already, was also a writer to the signet. He married Jane Johnson, who had been involved in shipping, uh, sending material to New Zealand. Uh, John Auld, I think, was part of the Free Church movement. He was very active in setting up the Otago Association, and when McGlashan left, he took over a lot of responsibility. And some of the things that he did was to include, uh, include finding masters for Dunedin High School. Uh, the first, those four professors that I showed, selecting immigrants, every so often a message would go back that we need more people for certain roles, and often we need more women, send out more women to Dunedin because it's rather top heavy with male labourers. Uh, he selected books for the library. The news of gold diggings came through the agents. He obtained royal charter for the university, uh, involved in finding rail for the ra uh, railway tracks for the railway, iron girders to put bridges in, uh, seeds for planting, and over of salmon. And in fact, when he died, he died having fallen into the SS Timaru. Uh, he was inspecting the holes because they had um, pond or they, they had tanks for the salmon over and he was down inspecting this fell, developed pneumonia and died and so his son then took over the practice. Uh, earlier I talked about Cargill. William Cargill was also a writer of the signet, so that there were a group of these people living close to each other. Now this is Edinburgh, uh, if I demonstrate this by, let me just see, what? Um, so, so the uh, castle, let me just see if I can find the pointer. It's the red arrow at the bottom. At the top? Yeah, the red thing. That helps. So here is here is the castle. This is old Edinburgh. Down here is the the palace. This was the new town, Princess Street, George Street, not as flamboyant as here in Dunedin. Uh -huh. <laughs> and this is Drummond Place, where John Halliday Scott was born. And if I then show you, uh, a map of the eastern end of the new town. And so here is Drummond Place. This is Scotland Street. This is where Robert Cargill lived and practiced. Down here where Crawford and Ald had their practice rooms in Duke Street, um, George Street here, where McGlashan had an office here, and the Otago Association, the New Zealand Company, were here in St Andrew's Square. So they all lived and practiced close to each other. And although I can't find any correspondence to say, what are you doing on Saturday night? Would you like to come around and watch the rugby? I'm sure that these people knew each other professionally and knew each other socially. And so as John Halliday Scott was growing up, and indeed with Cunningham, because Scott and Cunningham being the same year together at medical school, spent time in each other's houses, and also mixing with the olds, that they knew what was happening 
uh, and I've said here, these lawyers and their families knew each other and long before J.H. Scott applied, Auld had informed him and Cunningham of what was developing in Dunedin. So through this connection, the writers of the Signet, uh, it was possible for them to understand a lot about uh, the potential in Dunedin. Oh, sorry. How many of you are familiar with the Munro collection? Can you go and read it? I have to say, when I was a medical student here, I had no idea about this. Even when I did my uh, Bachelor of Medical Science, which was in pathology rather than anatomy, but I, I never got into that area. But uh, Donald Kerr has, has very kindly introduced me to the Monroe collection and I just want to tell you a little bit about the Monroe dynasty to consider whether this had any influence on Scott coming out here. So it goes back before John Monroe, but John Munro, along with two colleagues, George Rummond who was a provost or mayor of Edinburgh and the Duke of Argyll, Archibald Campbell who had also studied in Leiden uh, and those were the days where medicine was just starting to look at quantification. Uh, Boerhaave was an enthusiast about using physics in medicine, so there, there was an enthusiasm about setting up a medical school in Edinburgh. <coughs> and Munro said he'd go along with it, providing they would appoint his son as the first professor of anatomy. <laughs> and this rather strange arrangement where where father, son, and grandson, primus tertius, uh, primus secundus tertius. 126 years of Monroe dynasty teaching anatomy at a time when Edinburgh was starting to flourish. It was the Scottish Enlightenment. A lot of people came to Scotland because there was learning, and people came from around Europe to study medicine. In, in Edinburgh. Alexander Munro Secundus was probably the greatest of those three, estimated that he taught over 14,000 students during his 50 years as professor, and Tertius was probably a bit of a disappointment. Tertius had 12 children, a son, Henry, and perhaps the only claim to fame is that Henry's son was Charles Monroe. Now, we've recently been talking about, uh, w well, not talking, there have been um, uh, programs showing World War I and the anniversary of Gallipoli and what a disaster Gallipoli was. And it was Charles Monroe who took over as general after Hamilton and somehow managed to evacuate the Dardanelles with, I think, the loss of one life. So that was the connection, that side of the Munros. Another son, the seventh son, was David Munro. And David Munro studied medicine. He went back and worked in his father's department. I think his father was a bit of an embarrassment. And so David Munro bought three plots of land and went out as one of the early settlers in Nelson. And while at Nelson, he joined Tuckett. I'd mentioned that Frederick Tuckett, who was the government surveyor, uh, had taken a group of them down to survey the East Coast. And David Munro went along with that expedition. Um, became involved in local politics initially and then went to Wellington where he became Speaker in the House. His son, Charles Monroe, has a curious claim to fame in that Charles started his schooling at Nelson College. It was decided that he should finish his schooling at an English school and so he went to Christ College, Finchley. North London, which was Maggie Thatcher's electorate and near uh, where we lived in Barnet. And there 
Charles Munro experienced the game played with an oval ball and he brought this back to New Zealand um, along with the book of rules and the first game of rugby played in Nelson between the school and the town and then not long after that I think they went to Petoni and set up the Petoni school so the Munro dynasty is associated with that. John Goodsir became Tertius's successor. Uh, the interesting thing was that these Munros had had promoted what we would call morbid anatomy, that is a, an understanding of the gross structure of the body. Goodsir became a microscopist, so he started looking at histology down down a microscope. And these. Monroe's had collected between them, sorry, had collected between them almost 400 medical volumes going back, in some cases going back to uh, early printed copies. Let me just find my, um, and this, let me just see if I can find it. Um, Hippocrates, Galen, Vesalius, obviously uh, translated contemporary texts in anatomy, their own published works. Uh, when Tertius died, this collection of books, 400 books, was sent to Sir David in Nelson, where they arrived in Nelson in 1871. Now, if I was setting out to be professor of anatomy, and I knew that there was this wealth of anatomical textbooks, the library waiting for me, that would have been significant incentive to go. But there is a letter written by Dr. Mullins to Professor Adams, who was professor of anatomy at the time. Mullen said, it's just about 70 years ago, in 1884, since I first called on Professor John Halliday Scott to see about entering the medical school as a student. And he then goes on and says, one day when Scott was talking about the foramen of Monroe, he stopped and asked me which of the professors Monroe the foramen was named after. I looked blank because I'd never heard of the Monroes at that time. Scott explained to me that there were three professors Monroe, Primus, Secundus and Tertius, and the foramen was named by Secundus. Neither Scott nor I had any prophetic knowledge that more than 45 years later, I, that is Mullen, would be called on to care for the box which had belonged to the three professors of the Munro dynasty. So there's no doubt that when Scott left Edinburgh to come here, he had no idea that this treasure was waiting for him. And it was only towards the end of his professional career that he became aware. And at one stage, these books were locked away in a storeroom in the House of Representatives in Wellington. And at least Scott had the opportunity to make sure that they were actually dug out of that and, and brought down here. So I've already mentioned the name Professor William Turner, Professor of Anatomy in Edinburgh. And this, I think, is probably one of the, one of the key factors in Scott coming out here. That's Professor Turner. Professor Turner, born in England to a father who was a cabinet maker and upholsterer. Uh, he left school at the age of 15, but showed some enthusiasm for nature, nature studies. And so he was appointed as an apprentice to an apothecary surgeon. At the age of 18, he was encouraged to enroll as a medical student at St. Bartholomew's in London and he studied in those days uh, in the medical school it was mainly dissection and so he worked with James Paget who was the uh, 
principal teacher at that time. And Good Sir wrote to Paget saying, I'm on the lookout for someone who will come to Edinburgh and help me in my department. And so Paget recommended that Turner go to Edinburgh. When he arrived there, he became interested not in microscopy, which was Good Sir's area of, of expertise, but in comparative anatomy. And he then went on to develop this. You'll recognize that 1859 is the time that Darwin published his Origin of the Species. Good Sir, because of his religious background, was aghast that this should even get public airing, whereas Turner very quickly could see the academic opportunity that would come of this. And when Darwin had first come back in the Beagle, he had sent his uh, specimens to um, Richard Owens, but when he subsequently came back on the Challenger, all the specimens went to Turner. As a result of this, Turner was able to publish 277 papers, which even by today's term, the number of publications is pretty significant. Uh, 104 of those were in comparative anatomy and 51 in the new science of anthropology. Uh, Turner, when he became professor, had a reputation for teaching. The size of his classes increased 210 when he was first appointed to over 340 subsequently. In 1885 he had to pro provide dissection facilities for 636 students per year. Such was his influence that he appointed 23 of his previous pupils, including 16 of his previous staff members, to positions as professors of anatomy elsewhere around the world, and I'll show you a list of some of those. And he was a great administrator. Now, in 1858, in Britain, the Medical Act was passed, was passed to try and clarify who could practice medicine. There were a lot of charlatans and people who said that they came from Europe with medical experience. And so it was decided that there had to be a medical register, as there is now, and there had to be an assessment of the sort of training that you had. And so Turner became involved in this committee. He later on went to become the president of this committee or the General Medical Council. And later on, involved in the great debate as if you graduated from a university in medicine, was that adequate enough to practice medicine compared to if you came from a medical school, which was part of the London teaching hospitals, where you were taught medicine by dedicated doctors rather than airy-fairy academics, usually in Scotland. And so they were able to look very critically at the sort of teaching and background. And I will say to you that one of Scott's great advantages when he came to New Zealand was that probably even before he got on the ship, he was told that his teaching would be approved, not only by Edinburgh, but everywhere else in the UK would accept his teaching and that his undergraduates could come to the UK to finish off their medical qualification, which had been a huge hurdle that Kutri had been unable to, uh, to manage. Turner was a great administrator and he went on to become principal and vice-chancellor. An extraordinary step because Edinburgh was a Protestant university. St Andrews, Aberdeen, Glasgow had all been Catholic universities and Edinburgh was determined that it was going to be Church of Scotland, the Protestant church. And if you were to be appointed to the ranks of Vice-Chancellor, you had to belong to the Church of Scotland. Because Turner had come from England, he was not Church of Scotland. He was the first person to be appointed, and I, I'm sure there have been others since then. Uh, but his, his uh, contribution to not only the medical school, but to the university in Edinburgh 
was extremely important and probably set an example for Scott. And I'm sure that if Scott were back here and had a problem, he would say to Turner, or write to Turner and say, tell me what I do about this. Um, so we've already talked about the selection committee that Turner um, wrote this as distinguished career as a student, the experiences gained since graduation and the methods of anatomical work and teaching the highest testimony, the high testimony born of his personal character. He has the strongest claims for the appointment. These were the other chairs that were filled by Turner's uh, prodigies so that there was a network of people and if you, um, not that in those days you could uh, practice medicine in and out of Heathrow. So many British professors now only uh, meet their secretaries and collect the correspondence in Heathrow and then fly off again. But uh, in those days there was perhaps the opportunity to cable or to, um, to communicate. The recognition of teaching which was critical, the research themes and I'm going to show you that but the first one uh, that Scott did his master's thesis on the nervous system of the dog, which if you're going to practice medicine seems a long way away, and then anthropomorphic osteology. Uh, and we also know that Scott went back to Edinburgh. He went back because his sister was still alive and Scott sent two of his sons back to study in Edinburgh. So I'm sure there were ongoing links. Uh, I'm not going to, well, I'll, I'll read. The, these are Scott's publications compared to Turner, perhaps a rather small list. Uh, but the hand in different animals, the mechanisms of voice and speech, the tongue of the dog, the birds of Macquarie Islands, cancer in fish, and contributions to the osteology of the Aborigines of New Zealand and the Chatham Islands. So this was uh, a significant piece of work that Scott did. Scott knew that when Darwin had gone around the world and collected skulls from different continents, brought them back, it, uh, Turner had already an interest because there were a lot of old bones around Scotland and he compared cranial capacity over the centuries to see whether man and woman were getting bigger brains and perhaps their achievements were due to the size of the skull. Um, and he certainly looked at Moriori. Uh, Turner had described nine Moriori skulls. Scott went on to study 50 and there had been 76 Maori skulls. Um, 50 were adult males, 26 females, and 45 of these had come from uh, Naitahu, that is from the Canterbury and Otago area, so that there had been opportunities to look at a, at a large uh, family. And so was able to measure the skulls, measure cranial capacity, and to measure the palate, because the palate gives you an idea of how far apart the eyes are, and the nasal passages. Uh, reported that skeletal evidence that Moriori resulted from interbreeding of Polynesian and Melanesian antecedents. The Melanesian element was stronger because the cranial capacity is somewhat less. This is Scott's grave. Scott died in 1914. His boss, Turner, died two years later. This is their grave in a corner of the Dunedin North Cemetery, rather humble, but this is probably his monument. The medical school, the Hercus building, the Lindo Ferguson on the other side, and certainly since I was here, many other buildings, including this one we're in today, and of course the, the hospital opposite it. The, the interest I had, uh, I don't know if any of you know this book here, this is uh, Without Parade or Fuss, it's the, autobi it's the biography of John Haldane Scott, written by his 
grandson, John Hannay Scott, and I was um, fortunate to be able to meet him in 2014 uh, and to talk to him. He never knew his grandfather. His grandfather died uh, before he was born, but he knew from the various stories. And one of the things he said was that, of course, uh, grandfather wouldn't have come out to New Zealand unless he had done a lot of thorough researching and understanding what he was coming to and I'm sure that's where the association with the Alds, the writers of the Signet, was so important. Uh, and the other person that I had a chance to speak with was Marion Faulkner who was Scott's granddaughter and the comment that she made was Scott's boss, who was Turner Scott's boss, was asked to make the selection for Otago and he picked his own assistant for the job. So in finishing, Terence, just like to acknowledge uh, thanks and Donald who carefully showed me through his collection and the, the staff of those that I worked with and also James Hamilton who told me about the writer, the writer to the signet and uh, Ian Milne in the library at the Royal, Royal College Physicians of Edinburgh. So thank you very much. Questions? There must be lots of questions. But, but, uh, Donald uh, Kerr, would you um, comment on the, the Munro collection from you? You know, you've got a detailed knowledge of the, the Munro collection as well. Yes, Bob. Me? Oh. <laughs> um, well, so, um, I think um, Alan has actually covered it quite well, really. I mean, there's the marvellous, I mean, there's the, the 1555 Vesalius and yes. Albinus, and I guess it's the manuscript materials that that's, sits there. Um, uh, I mean, this material was actually in the medical library and it was transferred, I suppose, six or seven years ago to special collections over in the yes. glass building in Cumberland Street. Um, and I mean, I no longer look after it, but I would have loved to have more people like Alan coming through, and, and yourself, Terence, coming through to look at the materials, because it is a world-class collection of yes. anatomical rare book materials. Yeah. Um, and those manuscript materials are uh, mm -hmm. certainly... Uh, Don and, and Alan, how, how did it get out of the, the archives of the House of Representatives in Wellington to Dunedin? Was that... Scott, um, so from Sir David Monroe, it passed to his son-in-law, James Hector, who had married a Monroe daughter. Uh, and Hector didn't think it would have any use for the medical school uh, and thought that it should stay in the archives in Wellington. And Scott became aware of its existence towards the end of his uh, professional activity uh, in a discussion with someone that it was there and I don't know if he went up to have a look at it or whether books were brought down for him to, to look at and he said it needs to be here in Dunedin. I think he died before it was actually transferred. I think there was a list. A list of the books. It's an extraordinary collection, and I, you know, I just hope that people and Douglas Taylor, of course, who did so much um, fabulous work on creating the bibliography of the materials. I mean, his his work is a dense, you know, coverage of very complex materials, um, the hunters and you know, all the other books that are in this collection. So, um, yeah. I I know you run these lectures. Are there students who study in the history of medicine? No. Uh, no. Either within medicine or within the history? No, not much, at least. But because um, it's such a rich source of, it is. of material. Someone uh, who was studying history but didn't mind looking at anatomical diagrams. Yeah. Well, that's something that um, should be pursued, I guess. <laughs> 
Our medical students are very focused on finishing and getting out into practice. I think that would, would that be a fair comment? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, can I ask a question and a comment about Munro? Yeah. Is, uh, is Munro Street named after this Munro? And, uh, and, the, and the, was it, did I read correctly that Secundus was a professor before he graduated? Is that Correct, <laughs> yes, he, he was yeah. appointed as conjoint professor with his father, nominally head of the department, mm -hmm. uh, but even before he graduated, uh, he was <laughs> professor, I think it's called nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I, I guess he was such an extraordinarily good teacher that he got away with it. Uh, if it had been his son, Tertius, then it would have been... It, it said that Darwin left medicine. Originally he enrolled to study medicine in, in Edinburgh. And he said Tertius was as boring in his lectures as he was in his dress and his behaviour. Um, no one really took him seriously. Which... I think it's a bit of a pity. No, but, but he got, he got the foramen. Did, did you get the, the permission uh, about the street? Uh, so where is Monroe Street? Oh, up off Higer. And is it spelled M-O-N? M-O-N-R-O. -O -O -N. M -O -N -R -O -N. Uh, well, I'm tempted to say, because it's an unusual spelling, it's normally M-U-N. I'm tempted to say there must be a family connection, but I'm, I'm not sure <coughs> how to link it. Other questions? Well, Alan, thank you so much for an uh, absolutely wonderful talk. You know, you've uh, got a wealth of knowledge and uh, look forward to your next presentation, which uh, we, we will <laughs> organise very soon. Hopefully no more coronavirus in the meantime. Uh, Please uh, join me in thanking Alan.